Welcome everyone to this roundtable, virtual roundtable organized by the NUS Center for Asian Legal Studies or CALS. Uh, the director of CALS, Professor Jacqueline Neo, wanted me to say that this is a new series for CALS, but it's actually the seventh. This tells you how far into the year COVID-19 has brought us and how active CALS has been uh, this past year. My name is Hans Cho, and I'm director of the E.W. Barker Center for Law and Business that is jointly doing this particular webinar with CALS. We have an interesting topic today on COVID-19 and contractual obligations. I want to first acknowledge how forward-looking Professor Mindy Chen Wishart was in holding the last of a series of comparative Asian contract law conferences on what the common law understands as the frustration of contracts. Perhaps that is, that is why she is now Dean at Oxford. Some of our speakers today were here at NUS for that very conference almost a, a year ago now exactly, when the world was a very different place. They will today tell us how COVID-19 has resulted in a real-time experiment for different jurisdictions in dealing with supervening events. Representing the common law are Professors Dora Niu and Xiao Liu, who are leading contract law academics in Singapore and Hong Kong respectively. Chiao is, however, today looking mainly at China, a civil law country. I look forward to what civilian countries have done and will be doing. And for that, we also have Professor Kwon Yong Jun from Seoul National University in South Korea and Professor Munin Pongsapan, Dean of Tamasat University in Thailand. We have framed some questions for them to address, which includes both general legislative changes and also specific ones in particular areas like rental relief in their respective countries. In addition, there are other changes that may impact on contractual obligations, and we have asked the speakers to explore them and also to predict what future changes, some of which may well be permanent, we are likely to see as a result of COVID-19. So without further ado, I would like to first call on my wonderful colleague, Dora, to tell us what has been happening in Singapore. Thank you very much, Hans, um, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. In Singapore, COVID-19 has severely disrupted daily lives and has had a devastating effect on businesses and the economy as it has around the world. We have had a two-month circuit breaker period, something like a lockdown, uh, from April to June, and uh, our movements were severely curtailed at that point. Many businesses were closed and those of us who could worked from home. We are now in phase two of the safe reopening period where many restrictions have been eased, but substantial ones still remain. So let me get to today's topic. If a supplier cannot deliver goods or a contractor cannot complete the job on time, can the other party sue them for breach of contract or will they be able to escape liability by arguing that their inability to perform was due to COVID-19 and that they should be excused? I will look at this question in three parts by discussing first, frustration, second, force majeure, and then third, the new statute to deal with COVID-19 that we have in Singapore. In terms of the topic today, the first two, uh, the first two uh, parts are the existing legal norms, and the third is the legislative innovation. So let me start with frustration. Under the common law system, uh, whether or not a person is excused uh, from performance would depend on the doctrine of frustration, which deals with changes in circumstances after the contract has been entered into, but which are beyond the control of the parties. The test for frustration is whether or not the performance of the contract has become a radically different thing from what the parties had promised to do originally. This is a very narrow doctrine and um, it is difficult to satisfy the test of frustration. The contract will not be frustrated just because performance has become more difficult or more costly or has become less profitable. For example, the Singapore courts have said that any increase in costs, in costs will have to be astronomical before the doctrine of frustration can operate, if at all. So, a contract will be frustrated if it becomes impossible to perform. But normally, impossibility is hard to show because the court may find that one method of performance, even if it's impossible, other methods can still be used. 
But as COVID-19 is such an extreme and devastating event, it is likely that some courts will that some contracts will really be impossible to perform and will be found to be frustrated. A contract will also be frustrated if performance becomes illegal, and this is especially relevant in the current situation where illegality could take the form of contravening the regulations which have been put in place to control COVID-19. Frustration deals with contracts that were entered into before the pandemic started. But as it is a doctrine that deals with supervening events, contracts which have been entered into after COVID-19 will not be frustrated. And if uh, parties want to provide for these contracts, they want to be sure what's going to happen, they would have to provide for these particular, uh, for what is to happen in the, in, in the contract, uh, by the terms of the contract themselves. So the effect of frustration is that both parties are released from their obligation from the time of the frustrating event. And if there were any adjustments to be made, for example, if one person has paid a sum of money and the question is whether it should be refunded, then this will be something which will be dealt with under the Frustrated Contracts Act. So let me move on to the next part, which is on force majeure. Frustration operates by law, regardless of the intention of the parties. Sometimes the results can be uncertain. So for greater certainty, many parties may insert a force majeure clause in the contract. Under the common law system, force majeure doesn't have any specific meaning. It depends on the drafting of the clause. So parties who are unable to perform their contract because of COVID-19 may try to rely on a force majeure clause and two questions will be asked. The first is, does the event fall within the the force majeure clause. Does the event fall within the definition provided for in the clause? That's the first question. And the second question is, if it does, then what are the consequences provided for by the clause? So is the pandemic a force majeure event? We have to look at the force majeure clause in any particular contract to look at the definition of a force majeure event. So some contracts may have a list of items. For example, they may say that uh, the force majeure event is if there is a flood or an earthquake or a typhoon. So if there is a defined list like that, and the list does not include virus attack or health epidemic or something similar, then in fact the COVID-19 pandemic may not be covered or will not be covered by the clause, uh, and therefore the parties cannot rely on the force majeure clause. Even assuming that the pandemic is covered by the clause, then the next question is, what is to happen to the contract in this event? And sometimes the clause may provide that the party's um, duty to perform may be suspended for a certain period, or they may provide that the parties are discharged from the contract, or if the inability to perform is for a prolonged period, then they may provide that the parties should go for negotiation or arbitration. So if a force majeure clause applies, then what happens would depend very much on the terms of the clause. So looking ahead uh, to the future, if anybody is drafting a force majeure clause now, although in the past, the idea of a health pandemic may not have been in our minds to be put in this clause, certainly it's something to be included um, so that it is something that will be provided for in the future. Let me move on uh, to talk about the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act. This statute deals with various aspects of the COVID-19 crisis. And there is a particular part of the act which gives temporary relief from the inability to perform contracts. And before I talk about the statute, let me just read you a, a quote uh, from our Minister for Law. He said this, you are looking at economic devastation, businesses destroyed, people's lives ruined. And in such a situation, 
you don't talk contract. You talk equity, you talk justice, you talk about what is the right thing to do. So, apart, looking at the statute, a party who is unable to perform his contractual obligations due to a COVID-19 event may be able to get relief under the Act. This is a very wide-ranging Act, and for the purposes of today's talk, I will just mention some of the more core provisions. So certain, certain uh, types of contract are stated um, as listed in the Act, and the Act only would apply in these situations. So some examples would be contracts for secured loan agreements granted to SMEs, construction contracts and supply contracts, event and tourism related contracts, higher purchase and conditional sale agreements, leases and licenses of non-residential property, um, etc. So, if a contracting party is unable to perform their obligations in relation to one of the specified types of contracts, then the other party cannot take certain types of actions against them for a prescribed period. And this prescribed period is a period of initially six months starting from 20th April, 2020. This means that this period will expire on the 19th of October, 2020. Under the statute, there is a possibility that this period could be extended for up to a year. So what are some of the actions that must not be taken by the other party? The other party mustn't commence or continue an action in court against the non-performing party or against his guarantor. The, the aggrieved party also cannot commence arbitral proceedings under the Arbitration Act. He cannot enforce any security over any immovable property. Um, he cannot repossess goods under any higher purchase agreement or retention of title agreement. And uh, other, other instances include um, an ability to terminate a contract for the payment of rent. So these are wide ranging actions and they are really meant uh, to be a temporary, uh, a temporary protection for the person who is unable to perform. There are also special provisions against relief, in for feature, uh, relief against for feature in various contracts, specific contracts like event contracts or tourism related contract where a person has paid a deposit and the question is whether or not uh, the deposit should be uh, forfeited. Uh, and the answer is usually that there would be a period of time uh, during which this should not be done. I will move on to, to talk about uh, how to seek relief. Um, and the non-performing party, in order to get relief under this Act, must send a notice of relief to the other party, stating his inability to perform. And if the parties cannot agree, then the, the claim will be sent to a panel of assessors for determination, and the panel will decide on this. This is not a panel of judges. This is a panel of um, uh, people appointed, uh, and they would tend to be lawyers as well as academics. Some of my colleagues, for example, um, I think our moderator, Professor Hans Cho, is, a mod is, is an assessor um, under this particular statute. So the assessors will decide on various matters. For example, for the example, for example, for Section Five, which is um, the release of um, the the the. Uh, inability to sue, um, the assessor will decide whether um, the case is one to, which falls within the scheduled types of contracts and the assessor will decide uh, whether or not the event is one that is caused by COVID-19. So this is quite a, a powerful role and the decision of the assessor is final, no appeal is allowed. The parties will not be, not be allowed to be represented by any advocate or solicitor at the hearing. Note that the legislative reliefs will not apply to contracts entered into after 25th of March 2020. 
Um, and in fact, anybody who wants to draft a contract now would have to put in their own provisions because this statute will not apply to protect them. Uh, now, having known of this event, they should look after themselves by putting in the provisions under the contract. So what is the relationship between the legislative measures and the doctrine of force majeure uh, or frustration? Um, the point is that the measures only impose a moratorium. They are only a temporary relief, and this only would apply for the prescribed period. So after the period is over, questions of whether the contract has been frustrated, whether or not a, clause, a force majeure clause would apply, those questions would still have to be uh, decided. So these measures are temporary. The legislature wants to protect the economy, but not overly interfere with the freedom of contract. Um, I can see that my time is almost up. So I think I will end here, and if there are any questions, I'll take them later. I'm certainly looking forward uh, to hearing the other panelists on the situation in their countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dora, for that excellent presentation. Like, like Dora says, I'm sure some of you have questions, but please save them to the end. Um, you can use the Q&A uh, facility on this webinar, and then we'll try and consolidate the questions after all the presenters have had their 15 minutes. I'd like to call on Xiao Liu next. Um, he's actually well known to us in Singapore because he's got a very well known article on anticipatory breach that our Court of Appeal cited extensively. Uh, thank you, Hans. Um, um, I'm, it's, a, it's really a great pleasure to be here. And uh, it's uh, also a very um, 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 uh, pleasure to, to see everyone or uh, everyone here. Uh, so um, the title of my today's uh, presentation is Combating virus judicial lawmaking in the PRC. So as you can see from this title, I'm going to focus on the jurisdiction of mainland China. Uh, now, unlike common law jurisdictions, mainland China legislature has not taken any actions uh, to combat uh, virus, the pandemic. Uh, the reason is very simple because it takes a long time for the leg legislature to pass a uh, proper legislation. Uh, instead, People's courts in China have taken quick actions to, uh, to issue a great number of documents which contain rules um, which we may change the previous uh, rules of contract law um, uh, designed specifically uh, for, the, for cases involving the pandemic. So that will be the focus of my presentation. And we will see how these documents, how these judicial rules have, have changed the existing law in China. Okay. Um, all right. So, but first of all, I, I, I want to explain the nature of these documents issued by people's courts. And we, will, we all know that documents can be of various types, uh, um, um, documents issued by courts. So basically, I, we can classify these documents into some broader categories. The first and the most important category is what is called a judicial interpretation. Now, judicial interpretation can only be issued by Supreme People's Court. That is the highest court in China. And this judicial interpretation is binding. So it does have a formal legal binding force because it follows a set of procedures. Uh, it has to be approved by the judicial committee of the Supreme People's Court and it has to uh, follow strictly the procedures and uh, it has a unique identification code. So judicial interpretation is undoubtedly legally binding. That is uh, possibly the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the best form of, uh, of making uh, binding law. However, in the case of the pandemic, Supreme People's Court choose not to issue judicial interpretations, but instead, to issue what we can call judicial documents. These judicial documents have a dubious, um, uh, dubious status because we cannot say they are formally binding. However, however, they are in fact followed by lower courts. So in fact, they are binding. They are binding in the sense that the lower courts will cite these documents in the decisions. They will follow uh, the rules provided in these documents. So in fact, 
there is a de facto binding force in these documents. So as far as, as we can see, Supreme People's Court has so far issued four such documents. So Supreme People's guide, Guiding Opinion number one, number two, number three, and most recently, there is a notice on issues in, uh, uh, related to um, travel, travel contracts. Um, now, if we turn to local people's courts, can they issue legally binding judicial documents? Now, uh, that is again a difficult question because formally, uh, local people's courts cannot issue legally binding documents or rules. They do not have the power to make laws, but in reality, it's quite different. So even if the Supreme People's Court has said explicitly that local people's court, including high people's court, intermediate people's court, and all lower courts, they cannot issue judicial documents akin to judicial interpretations, but local courts are allowed to issue other documents. So that is, I think, the, um, uh, what local courts are doing here. They try to issue documents which are said not to be judicial interpretations, but in fact, these documents can have actual legal effect, just as judicial interpretations do. So, so far we have 21 documents issued by high people's courts in a number of provinces. Um, I'm not looking at um, documents issued by um, further lower courts, because I think the 21 documents already show that what is uh, most important uh, in the, uh, in the, in the um, uh, issues uh, dealt with by, uh, by, the, uh, by the Chinese judiciary. So we have the four Supreme People's Court judicial documents. We have 21 documents issued by High People's Court. And that is the basis on which I try to see whether the rules have made any change to existing law. Uh, of course, these documents uh, um, consist of a number of uh, a number of uh, different provisions. So we cannot deal with all these provisions uh, one by one in detail. Uh, rather, what I'm trying to do next is to summarize some uh, some most important general themes or principles out of these uh, documents. So. <clears throat> Uh, if we look at the structure of the substantive law in China, we we'll see that there are two separate legal doctrines which might govern the situation where a contract performance is affected by the pandemic. One doctrine is called the doctrine of force majeure. Uh, the doctrine of force majeure can have two different legal consequences. One is that um, a party who breached the contract because of the pandemic can, can be exempted from liability for breach of contract. Uh, and in, in this um, respect, uh, the test, the legal test is whether the contract performance is rendered impossible or the party is uh, made unable to perform the contract. So it's a rather strict test. And this test has been used a lot in SOS case in 2002 and 2003. But courts and people often overlook that the doctrine of force majeure can also have another consequence. And that's the second consequence, uh, which is one party, one contracting party can terminate the whole con contract by serving a notice to the other party if, uh, if, the, if the pandemic or if the force majeure renders the purpose of contract unfulfillable. So if because of the pandemic, the purpose of the contract cannot be fulfilled, then one of the parties may terminate the whole contract by serving a notice. So here we can see that legal test is what I call contract purpose test. It is wider and more flexible than the impossibility test uh, under the first consequence. Now, if we look at the documents issued by Supreme People's Court in response to the pandemic COVID-19, we we'll see that more importance is attached to the second uh, contract purpose test as compared to the impossibility test which prevailed in the source cases. So this is a change we can see um, how the courts dealt with uh, the COVID-19 cases in the future. They may deal with uh, the such cases in the future. Uh, they, 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 they may take a different approach by applying um, contract purpose test. The second 
uh, doctrine under the Chinese law is doctrine of change of circumstances. Well, under this doctrine, if there is a change of circumstances, which makes continuing performance of the contract manifestly unfair, then one of the parties may apply to the court for the court to modify or terminate the contract. Now, this law uh, was first formally recognized by the Supreme People's Court in 2009. So it did not feature at all in such cases. But now, because it has become part of Chinese law, it has been embodied in the recent civil code, Article 533. And therefore, in the judicial documents relating to COVID-19, there is a lot of reference to this doctrine of change of circumstances. We see a wider re recognition of this doctrine in COVID-19 docu documents. So we can, we can see that overall there is, a, there is a change in the structural sense where the, the courts in dealing with COVID-19 cases, they may make more use of contract purpose test when dealing with force module cases, uh, and they may make more use of the doctrine of change of circumstances. Again, from these, uh, all these um, uh, documents and all the different provisions, uh, I can summarize some, um, some notable features as far as the general contractual principles are concerned. And these uh, features are first, um, I, I would like to call this a supremacy of party-led solutions. And all the courts, they say, uh, universally that the parties, they should renegotiate the contract, they should resort to mediation um, before they could, um, they could exercise their strict legal rights. The second point, point is similar. Now, uh, when, they re when they try to exercise their legal right, then the legal right to modify the contract instead of terminate the contract will be preferred. So there is a clear preference for contract modification over contract termination. And finally, uh, this is not um, a new change in, uh, or innovation. Instead, it's a um, firm confirmation of a past practice in Chinese courts where when the contract is terminated uh, because of force majeure or because of change of circumstances, then the courts will have a wide discretion to say how the loss is going to be allocated between the parties. The only guideline we can see from past cases and documents is that the court will allocate the laws fairly between the parties. So you can see this is a source of uncertainty, but on the other hand, we can, we can see that the judges, they, they do have these uh, very flexible tools in order to achieve the desirable results they see fit in COVID-19 cases. And finally, we see some provisions relating to specific types of contract, which seem to implement special policies. And these special policies may not uh, outlive the pandemic because they are designed specifically for the pan pandemic. So in that sense, you can, see, you can say they are temporary. And they are temporary, um, but they can also be uh, very important so I will just give some examples of, of what these special policies are. First, there seems to be a spe special uh, policy to protect employees instead of employers under an employment contract. So for example, the employees may terminate the contract if the employer failed to pay salary, failed to pay social security, failed to provide work, even if the reason why the employer fails to do so is because of the pandemic, still employees can terminate the contract. On the other hand, employer cannot do that. Employer cannot terminate the contract because the employee failed to turn up for work. They failed to complete the work as contracted. So you can see this is a, there is a favored treatment of employees uh, in this context. Uh, another example will be this contract. Um, the, uh, some of the documents have made two notable distinctions. Uh, distinctions. Uh, uh, one is um, um, relating to longer term lease and short term lease. Well, the rule is that it is harder to justify a 
a termination of a long-term lease as compared to a short-term lease. Another distinction is between residential lease and commercial lease. The rule is it's harder to justify a modification of a residential lease as compared to a commercial lease. And certainly, there is also favor the treatment of consumers. The consumers, they are better pro protected than businesses. For example, under hospitality contracts, if the business fails to provide accommodation, transportation, travel, on time or um, pursuant to the terms of the contract, then the consumers can get out of the contract anytime. And finally, uh, under knowns contract, individuals or small or medium-sized enterprises are given uh, more protection in the sense that they can terminate the contract um, um, anytime if the, if the bank is in breach of contract, but bank cannot do so. Uh, they cannot accelerate repayment of debt. They cannot terminate the contract if, uh, if, if um, um, there is late payment uh, in installment. Now, we have talked about termination here, but at the same time, we see that in order to, um, uh, in order to save some businesses, these documents also provide that if the businesses are liable to pay financial compensation, financial compensation can be reduced or even waived if they really suffer financial difficulties because of pandemic. So what we see here is they, these documents are trying to do a balancing act, but they, they do have a, a special protective policy, policy in favor of the, these certain group of people I mentioned before. Um, well, these are the main points I, will, I wish to make today. And for further details, um, you are all very welcome to have a look at my recent piece um, um, in Chinese Journal of Comparative Law. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks very much, Chiao. It's interesting that the Chinese courts um, seem to have the same concerns that the government here had. So you have done through the court system what we have done through the legislature, right? Uh, now we have Yongjun telling us what Korea has done. And it's interesting because um, the, the northern part of Asia has actually handled COVID better than most. Um, so, you know, let's. Tell us what's happening in, in, in Korea, Yongjun. It is indeed my great pleasure to be part of this wonderful active event. And I'll be focusing on two aspects. Uh, firstly, I will address the rhino aspect on COVID-19 regarding contract law. So far, there have been no special legislation in the realm of private law in response to COVID-19. Therefore, traditional private law doctrines, such as the doctrine of change of circumstances, courts majeure, or good faith principle are still valid and are still applicable to, to those cases. Um, secondly, I will address policy aspect or administrative aspect of this issue. Although the law basically remains the same, response of the governmental agency in the middle of this crisis may become important. In fact, there are several governmental organizations that utilize their power and authority to protect consumers or, or laborers. And these measures do have impact on the market. And I mentioned that as well. So the first private law doctrine that comes up is the doctrine of change of circumstances, as have been explained by, by, by my colleagues in the previous panelist discussions. There are cases where enforcing the contract on its face would put one party in a drastically disadvantaged position due to the exposed change of circumstances surrounding the contract. And imposing excessively onerous burden on a forklift party who never assumed or foresaw such an unanticipated risk at the time of contract seems unfair. Now, COVID-19 creates such situations quite frequently. In order to materialize this value, uh, putting certain limit on the principle of accident servanda seems inevitable. The doctrine of change of circumstances in Korea is one of the means to set forth proper limitation on these principles, thereby drawing a boundary between the sanctity of the contract and paternalistic intervention to terminate or modify the contract. And such boundary drawing function of the doctrine can also be explained from the perspective of risk allocation. There are cases where contract termination or modification is allowed on the ground of change of circumstances pursuant to certain specific statutory or contract provisions. And in such cases, you can just follow what, what the law or what the contract says. 
issue arises when there are no such provisions either in law or contract. And this is where the genuine sense of the doctrine of change of circumstances kicks in. And this doctrine has been recognized by Korean civil law scholars as one of the doctrines deriving from the principle of good faith. And this doctrine was also explicitly accepted by the Supreme Court of Korea in 2007. And according to this decision, this doctrine can be invoked when there's an exposed, significant, and unforeseeable change of the underlying fundamental circumstances and adherence to an original terms and conditions may amount to violation of good faith principle. However, the scope of its applicability still remains questionable. The Supreme Court has seldom applied this doctrine to a specific case, notwithstanding its general acceptance of the doctrine on the theoretical level. Such reluctant attitude toward this doctrine is also found among the lower courts. Therefore, its theoretical and practical implication on contract law is still considered one of the most intriguing yet unresolved issues in Korean contract law. Given strictness of the Korean courts toward actual application of this doctrine, there is less likelihood that the relief on contracting parties who are unable to perform due to COVID-19 crisis would be rendered based on this doctrine unless contractual statutory provisions provide such grounds. Secondly, a first major clause may be a ground for modification or rescission of contract due to COVID-19. Force major under the Korean Civil Code is generally defined as an accident that the obligor was unable to anticipate or avoid despite exercise of utmost care. Therefore, a force major event is an accident occurring externally that is act of God, including earthquake and storms, or social incidents, including riots, war, and blockades. And therefore, any personal reasons such as financial status or absence of the obligor cannot constitute force majeure events. And as one of the requirements of force majeure, the Supreme Court demands that the accident should occur beyond the obligor's control. As such, since a force majeure event should be an accident that the debtor was unable to anticipate or avoid despite her exercise of utmost care, any accident or event that the debtor was able to anticipate or avoid cannot constitute a force major event. Of course, the concept and the scope of force major flows should be determined on a case-by-case -case approach. It depends on how force major is defined and illustrated in a specific contract. We can also easily expect that after the outbreak of the pandemic, the parties are more likely to include a force major clause that manifestly alludes to pandemic as one of, the, one of the causes of force majeure. In terms of the scope of liability, COVID-19 can be a cause for limiting liability. The Korean um, Civil Code expressly provides for ground for liquidated damages. And the Korean Civil Code also states that the court may reduce the amount of liquidated damages to an appropriate sum when it is considered too ex um, excessive. Further, the Korean courts offers a ground on the basis of public policy for reducing penalty when it is overly excessive. And COVID-19 surely may be a major factor to be considered in assessing appropriateness of the amount of either liquid damages or penalty. Of course, there's a complicated doctrinal issue as to the point of time when appropriateness of amount should be considered. However, Prevailing opinion is that the court can consider factors that arose after the execution of contract. Therefore, reflecting COVID-19 that broke out after the execution of contract would not be a problem. And there are other doctrinal issues that are related to COVID-19, such as good faith principle, impossibility, mitigation of damages, and so forth. However, given the restriction on time, I will now move on to the policy aspect of COVID-19. A competition enforcement authority in Korea is the Korea Fair Trade Commission. And recently, its chairperson visited the Association of Electronic Companies and Automotive Companies. These industry sectors account for a greater portion of our economy. And the chairperson explained to manufacturers and companies that their position as main contractors tend to be superior 
than that of suppliers of raw materials, and that they should strive to ensure that suppliers or subcontractors are not disadvantaged by any disruptions caused by COVID-19. In particular, in anticipation of delays in supply of raw materials, the chairperson stated that the Commission will closely monitor relevant industries to ensure that no penalties are unfairly shifted to suppliers. They also stated that imposition of penalties for delay in contract performance during the COVID-19 crisis could lead to a violation of the Subcontracting Act. She also recommended that um, manufacturers and main contractors are uh, recommended to use the standard subcontracting agreement published by the Fair Trade Commission, which does not count the delays caused by first major events toward, toward, toward the duration of delays that are subject to penalties. So based on the recommendation, it is quite conceivable that Korean Fair Trade Commission could potentially raise issues when non-compliance by the companies occurs. And the Commission is also keeping eyes on issues relating to penalty fees for cancellations. Due to COVID-19, the number of cancellations of contract arose, especially in the area of tourism, air transportation, food service, hotel and accommodations, and wedding services. And these are sometimes inevitable because of the governmental restriction. Despite the rise in consumer complaints, Korean Fair Trade Commission does not plan to impose a uniform guideline to determine whether cancellation penalty fees should be waived, considering the private and contractual nature of the provisions governing cancellation penalty fees. Um, so uh, under these circumstances, the Korea Consumer Agency's Consumer Dispute Resolution Procedure of private lawsuits are likely to be a primary avenue to contest cancellation penalty fee issues. And finally, the Ministry of Economy and Finance, which is the government authority charged with enforcing the Government Contract Act, has issued the Public Contract Management Guideline for Coronavirus. And the guideline provides that when administering public contracts, government authorities or public agencies must issue stop work orders on construction or service provided at sites where work is deemed substantially impaired due to confirmed or presumptive positive cases of coronavirus and extend the deadline for performance as necessary and increase the contract price so as to cover additional costs incurred by the contractors. And where the stop work order are not issued, they should exempt contractors from liquidity damages for delays due to unavoidable impairment in work or supply in connection with the COVID-19 and make adjustments to the contract price in accordance with requirements for adjustment. Now in the future, parties will be more actively involved with ex ante contracting to allocate the risk of pandemic. Second order contracts such as stand steel agreements will be made to enable parties to adjust commercial relationships in ways that may preserve more value at lower cost than public interventions. And finally, the value of paternalistic intervention will arise. So this is for, this is for my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Yongjun. Sounds like this is South Korean administrative agencies have been very much hard at work um, in trying to sort out things at a microscopic level. Um, and now we'll have uh, Professor Munin to tell us about what Thailand's been doing. I guess we're back to Southeast Asia again. And um, we're happy to have Munin with us today because there was a risk that there was going to be a, there was a super leaning uh, factor that would have prevented him from speaking. But uh, we're going to have him now. Munin? It's a privilege to speak at um, this very interesting event. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as everyone knows, um, Thailand has done very well with um, the uh, health issues. But um, in terms of legal measures to help you know, to re reduce the effects of the, um, um, the COVID-19, I can, I can say is that um, we have done very little. Um, there is just a, a only one um, a legislation um, um, introduced by the government to help a specific group of people. Um, so um, the, major the majority of 
of people rely on what we got before um, the COVID-19. So it may be necessary for us to look at uh, the existing system um, in, in Thailand. So um, when it comes to um, a change of, of circumstance in Thai law, um, we got two systems. The first one is impossibility of performance. And the second one is good face. I'll give you um, a little bit more detail of um, the impossibility of performance um, in Thailand. Um, the system of impossibility of performance um, is based on um, the debtor's fault. Um, um, we got two rules which were copied from the German Civil Court. Um, according to uh, Section 219, if a circumstance permanently prevents uh, performance without fault of the debtor, it relieves the debtor from the obligation entirely, but doesn't end the contract. Um, we got um, another rule um, uh, which can be called uh, temporary uh, impossibility of performance. It's not a real impossibility of performance because it's just temporary. Um, it's um, section 205. Um, and, and I have to say is that we relied heavily on this provision at, at, at the moment. According to section 205, if a circumstance temporarily prevents performance without fault of the debtor, it can be used as an excuse for breach of contract for delay uh, in performance in particular. This rule was also copied from the German Civil Court. Um, so if you look at um, the concept of economic impossibility, hardship or force majeure, uh, the Civil and Commercial Court does mention um, force majeure, but you know, economic impossibility, hardship, and force majeure do not automatically save the debtor from breach of contract. They can help the debtor um, escape from the obligation or liability with the help of Section 219 or uh, Section uh, 205. So the debtor will have to satisfy uh, the conditions uh, of uh, these two provisions in order to to uh, benefit uh, from hardship or from uh, force majeure. So um, I, I can give you an example of how the Supreme Court of Thailand um, um, you know, decided on the, um, on the concept of uh, the impossibility of performance, especially um, um, with regard to uh, the concept of economic impossibility. Um, the Supreme Court decision decided in 2002 is a case um, concerning a company which was affected heavily by um, the 1998 Asian financial crisis. Um, and, you know, the, the court says that um, the 1998 Asian financial crisis, which caused the collapse of most financial institutions and gross damage to all business sectors in Thailand, and which severely affected many debtors' ability to repay debt owed to financial institutions did not automatically render performance impossible. The court needs to verify impossibility of performance on a case-by-case -case basis in order to determine whether the debtor is relieved from the obligation without liability. So um, there is no question of you know, uh, you know, hardship. The court did not try to um, uh, applied, you know, like a general uh, principle of hardship or a general principle of good faith. It just rely on uh, the concept of imp impossibility of performance and the court rejected uh, the debtor's argument. Um, and then there is another uh, Supreme Court case in 19, um, an earlier one in 1979. Again, there was a situation where, um, you know, um, the price of crude oil, you know, increased significantly. Uh, and the court held that this is not a case of um, this is not a case of impossibility of performance. Um, so um, the debtor will be required to prove uh, impossibility of performance, uh, permanent impossibility, or uh, temporary impossibility as an excuse for breach of contract. So let's move on to uh, the second system that may help the debtor deal with uh, a, a change of circumstance in Thailand. I'm talking about uh, the principle of good faith. Um, we got um, a, a couple of rules um, you know, reflecting the principle of good faith. 
Um, the, the first one is section five of the Thai Syrian Commercial Court. It says that every person must in the exercise of his rights and in the performance of his obligations act in good faith. Um, sec, uh, we also have uh, another section uh, which mentions uh, good faith. Uh, section 368, uh, contract, contracts shall be interpreted according to the requirements of good faith. Ordinary usage being taken into consideration. Um, um, some scholars suggest that um, in, in case of a change of circumstance, um, uh, section five and section um, 368 can be you know, helpful. Um, um, if um, the impossibility of performance doesn't work, um, maybe we can, we can try to invoke these two provisions. However, um, Thai courts are quite reluctant to, to apply um, these two rules of good faith because their scopes uh, are quite broad. Um, so um, now let's take a look at what Thailand has done in terms of uh, legislative efforts, okay? Um, as, I, as I said earlier, um, there is no major change, there is no ma uh, major legislative change to the existing uh, Thai law. Um, we, we, we have uh, something like the COVID-19 uh, temporary measures, uh, uh, um, and the one in Singapore. Um, however, there are some small uh, legal and relief measures introduced by um, the Bank of Thailand. Um, and also we have uh, one legislation um, um, in the form of emergency decree uh, um, introduced by um, the Thai government. So um, what we have done so far, the, the small changes or the small legal and uh, relief measures, um, um, I can give you some examples, major examples. Um, uh, the first one um, is, <laughs> Um, the commercial banks ex extend the personal and, and corporate income tax submission deadline from um, the 31st of March uh, to the 31st of, of August um, uh, 2020. And also, um, the, the, the Bank of Thailand, you know, work with uh, major commercial banks uh, and, and they, um, you know, um, signed a, a kind of MOU um, uh, to, to introduce some relief measures. Um, um, for example, they agreed to reduce a minimum payment of credit card for two years. Um, uh, in the past, um, the, the debtor will have to um, pay um, at, um, at least 10% of the outstanding uh, for each credit card bill. Now, um, they agree to reduce from 10 to 5%. And also, um, they introduced a temporary cessation of a principal and interest for three months for personal loans paid in installments. And um, also they introduced um, temporary cessation of uh, principal and interest for three months or any principal, uh, for, uh, for any principal, sorry, um, or only principal for six months for motorcycle and car high purchases. Um, if um, the value of um, the uh, motorcycle uh, is no more than uh, 35,000 baht. Uh, if the value of um, the car uh, is no more than uh, 250,000 baht, for example. And so and they also have um, 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 a measure to help SMEs. Um, the government um, passed an emergency decree, which is equivalent uh, to an act. But this is, this is the only uh, legislation introduced by the government, and this is the only proper law uh, in, uh, which has been introduced by the Thai government so far. Uh, it is called uh, the Emergency Decree on Financial Measures for SMEs Affected by the COVID-19. Um, um, basically, um, this emergency decree focuses on um, two measures. Um, um, first, it's a temporary cessation of uh, the principal and interest uh, for SMEs. And um, the, second, the second thing is uh, um, the um, off offers uh, of uh, soft loans for SMEs. Um, and we also have the um, another um, a small uh, legislative, legislative change uh, concerning um, online um, conferencing or e-meetings. 
Uh, in the past, when uh, we held uh, a shareholding uh, meeting, uh, um, the shareholders must meet uh, physically. Um, um, but now, um, we can do it electronically. We can do it online. Um, so um, it, now the uh, Thai society, um, uh, apart from SMEs, apart from you know, uh, customers of commercial banks, um, we need to rely on the existing system. And um, just um, um, in um, March, um, the, my faculty of law uh, established um, a pro bono uh, center to help um, uh, those who are affected by uh, the COVID-19 uh, free of charge. And, and we, uh, we do it you know, 100% uh, online. And, um, and I can show you um, the statistics. Uh, out of uh, 80 cases we receive, 55% um, uh, uh, are labor disputes. And 30% uh, are contract disputes. Um, and so I will show you uh, one case study, you know, um, of, a, of a rental contract. Um, um, this is a real case. Um, a rents a retail unit in a shopping mall owned by B to run a cafe. The government temporarily closes most stores. A still has access to his cafe, but cannot open it to customers. Does A have to pay rental during the closure? So, um, you know, um, A um, came to us uh, seeking our legal advice because um, um, the, the lesser asked him to pay um, the uh, full uh, rental, but he um, did not have any income. He uh, did not have enough money to pay. So they asked us whether they, he had to pay. Um, the problem is the government doesn't have any, uh, uh, did not introduce any legal measures to help um, consumers, to help you know, uh, people like A. So um, what we did, um, we just you know, rely on um, what we, we got in the Syrian Commercial Court. Luckily, we have you know, um, um, a provision, um, section uh, 369, um, a party to a reciprocal contract may refuse to perform his obligation until the other party performs or tenders performance of his obligation. Um, so um, luckily we have this provision and, and we um, need a little bit help of the, the rule of interpretation as well. So what we told A is that because when you, when you rented um, the property, you expected to run you know, a cafe. So running a, a cafe is an object of the contract. And now um, the lesser, um, the landlord, you know, uh, was not able to, uh, to allow you uh, to use the property to achieve your, your objective. Therefore, um, um, he failed his obligation. Um, the, the landlord did not perform his obligation. Therefore, under this rule, section 369, um, A doesn't need to pay a rental in return. So um, this is how we, we, uh, we help um, um, the person affected um, deal with the situation, deal with the effects of, of uh, the COVID-19. But uh, my question is whether um, businesses and consumers in Thailand need more uh, legislative change to survive. Um, I, I can tell you a little bit uh, more that the Thai government set up um, a committee um, um, looking into the possibility of um, in introducing, uh, you know, a proper legal measures to um, help the people um, um, with the effects of uh, the COVID-19. We are working on that. And I, I hope that I will be able to uh, update you on, on the progress of this. Um, but I'm not really sure whether the government is really serious about, about this project. Um, but I should end it here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Munin. I would like to thank all our speakers uh, for their wonderful and most enlightening presentations. It just seems to me that things are never what they seem. Dora has shown us that there has been a great deal of legislative intervention in Singapore. Um, on the other hand, the civilian jurisdictions that we have just heard about today seem to be very self-reliant, which goes against what we usually think of their codified um, laws. So it could be that the long-term nature of contracts there 
And I was going to say things like good faith, although Munin says that was not really the thing that has helped in Thailand. But this long-term nature of contracts there seems to allow the legislators to leave it to the courts, as Chow has shown in China, uh, or the executive, as Yong Jun describes administrative measures in Korea, or even the market, as Munin describes self-help remedies in Thailand. Right? So it just looks like their societies and economies may actually be more robust than some in the, uh, in, the, in the Western world, right? And this could be because the network effects of more financialized and more developed economies mean that things are in fact less resilient. And so there are contagion effects that we first saw with the US subprime uh, problem, which then became the global financial crisis. Unfortunately, this has now been repeated with COVID-19. Uh, we now turn to the M&A part of this webinar. I've not looked at the questions yet, but let's now uh, sort of open the questions and have a look at them. Any of our speakers want to jump onto any question in particular yet? Or well, let's just have a look at them and see who answers what first. Okay, there's one that's clear. So it's to Professor Chiao Liu. This is from Yu Chuan Men. Um, many thanks for your succinct coverage of Chinese judicial responses. From a comparative law perspective, what's the doc doctrinal difference, if any, between the common law doctrine of contractual frustration, i.e. hardship and force majeure, and the civil law double doctrines, change of circumstances, and force majeure. It seems both function as exceptions to the principle of sanctity of contracts for equity, stroke, fairness considerations. Tiao? I think I will um, only be able to outline some of the differences between the two. Uh, as Dora has described, the doctrine of frustration is a very narrow doctrine in the common law. It is narrow, first in the sense that it requires contract performance being rendered radically different from uh, what is contracted for. So that's a, uh, that's, that's a very strict test. And the second point why it's a very narrow uh, doctrine is because the consequence of frustration is contract is automatically off, it's terminated. There is no middle ground. You cannot say that it's partially terminated or let's change some of the, of the terms. Let's let the contract to to, to continue in another form. That, those are not options under common law. So common law is a, it's a very narrow and extreme, uh, let's say, uh, doctrine. Uh, once you find, find the frustration, then the contract is off. If frustration is not there, then the contract will be as good as uh, it was before. Okay, so no change is not. But in Chinese law, that's not the case. The Chinese law, of course, that's not the invention of Chinese law. Chinese law has adopted um, um, the, the doctrine of change of circumstances, mainly from the German civil law. But in practice, I think Chinese judges have expected, uh, expanded this doctrine in a great deal by applying it to a great, great number of cases. Not only um, cases involving, uh, involving inflation, the inflation cases is what was the origin of change of circumstances cases in, in Germany. But it has been applied in China to a great number of cases, a great range of cases. So it's very, uh, very flexible. And if we look at the consequences, we will see that Chinese judges, they can modify the contract for the, for the parties. That's not something you will find in the common law system. Common law judges will very, um, uh, Normally, they will say very firmly, they are not going to write the contract for the parties. But that is precisely what Chinese judges are doing under this doctrine of change of circumstances. They prefer modify the contract uh, over termination of contract. So if it is possible, they will modify the contract and let it to continue and uh, alter the form. That's their preferred uh, solution. So you can see that uh, uh, on the one hand, this gives court the power, the latitude, the flexibility to deal with the problem. However, on the other hand, it will damage certainty because parties will have no idea what the result of the case will be. They have to leave the issue to the hands of the individual judge. They happen to, the, the case happened to find uh, during the, during the process. So it depends on the individual judges. Some judges will be more restrictive in exercising the discretion, some will not. 
Um, another difference I just want to mention very briefly is force majeure, uh, as described by Dora, is mainly a type of contract clauses in common law system. But in civil law traditions, it, it is perceived of as a legal doctrine, not a type of contract clause. So it's a, it's a standard imposed by the legislature at the parties normally cannot contract out of. They cannot say this event is not force majeure when the law says it is. So that's, that's also something that you, you, you may notice, uh, uh, which uh, the, there is a huge gap between common law and the civil law, including Chinese law in this area. Uh, thanks, Xiao. I think the first question by um, Mr. Henry Lee would be for Dora. Um, in Singapore, delays caused by COVID-19 impacts may be covered under the force majeure clause in the contract, or if not, the COVID-19 Act. But what about additional costs probably suffered by contractors due to this COVID-19 event? Uh, this would include increased material and labor costs resulting from travel restrictions. Do they have to bear the costs themselves? Um, are they able to recover this from the employer? Or is there any other way to deal with this? Dora? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, because of what the parties have agreed to do under the contract, essentially contractual obligations are strict. So it would be that a contractor, even if he has to um, incur increased costs, would have to deal with these costs uh, itself unless um, there is, uh, unless it amounts to, for example, a force major event, in which case then um, he would be excused. But I don't think this is what um, the questioner is, is asking about. And I think that ultimately, uh, the only way in which the contractor can get the other party to pay some of the costs is if there is um, a clause in the contract that provides uh, for this. And if uh, the possibility of increased costs is something which the parties want to provide, uh, want, want to make sure uh, that they provide for, then the contractual clause um, is the way to go for this. Uh, thanks very much, Dora. I think this would be for Munin, the second question. Um, in the adaptation of COVID-19 law from German law to Thai law, what were the modifications that were made to adopt it or adapt it to the needs of Thai society? Were there difficulties in transport? planting these procedural laws to Thailand. Thank you. Um, I have to say that we um, did not adopt any um, models from, from German law yet. Um, as, I, as, I, as I said earlier, um, the only legislation um, uh, introduced by the government is an emergency decree um, um, aimed at helping SME. We are, I mean, uh, a working uh, committee um, um, set up by the government um, is looking at the Singapore uh, COVID-19 uh, Temporary Measures Act as, uh, as a principal model um, for um, any uh, legislative changes. Um, and um, we look at some other countries, but uh, I, can, I, can, I can share with you now that uh, the Singapore Act is the principal one. Thank you. All right, just we'll stay with Munin because uh, the question by Selina Chong is actually, because I think you mentioned something about income tax submission delays, <laughs> right? So her question yes. is, how does a delay in income tax submission help a taxpayer uh, uh, to alleviate difficulties brought about by the, by the yes, pandemic? Yes, yes, yeah. I think I also, I also have that question. I, we, we, you know, we have, the same, we have the same question here in Thailand, but I guess that uh, the government just wanted to give more time uh, uh, to taxpayers to collect documents because they, they, they thought that it was quite difficult to, to get, you know, uh, uh, documents uh, to, to submit uh, 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 for, 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 for this purpose. So it just, you know, like uh, uh, for an, academic, uh, an administrative purpose. Um, could I? Could I just sure. add that? Sure, yeah, good. We do have this. We had the same <laughs> that they had extra time to submit the income tax yes. returns. And I think that Professor Moonin's explanation um, is a good one that probably applies to Singapore as well. Yes. The next question is from um, Lyndon Rom David. But I think I'll address it to uh, Yong Jun because actually I, Yong Jun spent quite a bit of time on talking about assumptions of risk and, and, and force majeure. So how are contracts on or providing assumption of risk, for example, in insurance contracts handle in your country's contract law, especially when these contracts on assumption of risk most probably did not contemplate the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, 
uh, when they were entered into perfected. Because I think, Yongjun, you mentioned about how the second stage of contracting now would take into account some of these things possibly. So this uh, Lyndon Davids from the University of Philippines College of Law and says that in the Philippines, assumption of risk is generally ex exempted from the force majeure doctrine. So if you assume that, I guess, you know, you should not be able to use a force majeure. Thank you very much for a great question. I, I believe that most all the contracts have some risk allocation mechanism incorporated in each contract to a certain extent. And, but there are some types of contract where this risk allocation mechanism is more apparent, just like an insurance contract or option contract. So I think it is, after all, a matter of contract interpretation. Um, the scope of the contract or the interpretation of contract will become a very important matter in addressing this issue. For example, uh, it would be very important to interpret whether or not a pandemic or COVID-19 crisis is included in the event that insurance covers. So after the interpretation of such contract, if we determine that it is a part of the insurance events that are covered by insurance policy, then let the insurance contract deal with it. But if it's not the case, then we return to a external doctrines outside the contract, which I've already addressed in my presentation, like change of circumstances doctrine. So I, my, my general answer is that it is after a matter of contract interpretation, especially a interpretation of insurance contract. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Youngjun. This next question by Valerie Vitkova. I'm not sure it's going to be fair on Dora because I can't visualize an answer to this, but I'll let Dora try, right? Um, the question is that the Singapore government is regulator, landowner, and promoter of real estate. Which role has been affected most by COVID-19 from a legal perspective, and how will these roles evolve in the future? I guess, how will these government roles as regulator, landowner, and promoter of real estate evolve in the future? That's a very interesting um, question. Um, I suppose that the question is asking about um, the government's role as compared to the, to the private individual's role, because ultimately, um, I'm just thinking that based on, um, the, based on the COVID-19 Measures Act, um, it doesn't make any difference whether you are the government um, or whether you, you are a governmental body or whether you are a private sector body. And I believe that um, the provisions would all um, apply. But if you think of the government as a regulator, they would have the power uh, to actually um, promulgate rules or regulations which they think um, would be fair. But of course, if you think about that uh, in relation to um, their role as a landowner, then there might be a conflict there if we're thinking about the profit motive. And of course, within the government itself, there would be uh, the tussle between which principles should be better principles. Um, and I think the third role was the promoter uh, of real estate. And of course, as a promoter of real estate, if, um, if, uh, the, if any measures are too harsh on the real estate industry, then that's going to lead um, to hardship as well. So I'm not sure which uh, role necessarily has been most affected, but I would think that uh, the government's role as a regulator would be the most powerful and all-encompassing one because in that role, it could actually affect um, the, the other two roles, which can, can control and affect the other two roles which it plays, which are mentioned. Um, I don't think I have very much insight into the real estate industry, but Hans, that's my attempt um, to answer this question. Uh, thanks very much, Dora. For my two cents worth, I think Dora mentioned that, you know, some of us are sort of assessors and trying to help um, solve some of these COVID problems. So one area that, that has come up is with options to purchase uh, land. And the government has introduced measures to say that um, if the option fee is to be forfeited after a certain date, um, they can't, the developer will not be able to forfeit it, right? But the market changes so quickly that before you knew it, the developers started extending these options, right? And so issues would arise as to when option fees are in fact forfeited, right? But some of us would even ask another question, which are option fees really forfeited in the first place because the option fee was paid at the start to buy the option, right? So I would say that the government tries to do what it can in a fair and balanced way. 
but the markets react in such a way because people are trying to protect themselves further, right? Or take advantage of situations. That's not possible to predict outcomes sometimes, despite what the government may try to do in its best in, uh, the best interest of the country, right? I'll quickly jump to Lance Ang's questions for you, Chiao, Chiao because uh, at least that's directed to you, right? Um, let me just read it, read it out. The contractual relief under Chinese law, including under the SPC judicial documents, is a general doctrine that applies to all types of contracts or only certain specified categories of contracts. And secondly, is there an expiry date or moratorium period for such contractual relief or is there an ongoing measure? Or is this an ongoing measure? Oh, thanks uh, for, the, for the question, okay. Um, for the first one, um, some of the um, uh, things I talked about uh, are relate to general contract doctrine uh, principles. They apply to all contracts over the board. Uh, for example, contract purpose test uh, and um, also change of circumstances, they all apply to all, si all sorts of contracts, but there are certain rules which are specifically for certain types of contracts, like um, employment contracts, employees' uh, rights, uh, and loan contracts, lease contracts, they all have different um, rules to cater for the special protective policies uh, in those areas. Uh, for the second question, although the provisions themselves do not say uh, what will be the end date, however, there is a very helpful guideline provided by many of the courts. They say the pandemic in China, uh, there is a starting date and the end date for the pandemic. The pandemic is regarded as a starting in late January when the national, the state response level is increased to level two in most of the provinces. And the pandemic is regarded as have ended in late April or the beginning of May when the response level in most provinces was lowered from level two to level three. So that's a very helpful and clear guideline. Uh, for all cases, the pandemic will be defined as, uh, as existing uh, in force in this period. Sorry, uh, Tiao, don't, don't go off. Uh, there's another question from Dylan Ma for you, um, which is that whether there are any examples of how the people's courts have modified the contracts affected by COVID-19? Are there any guidelines provided on what constitutes manifestly unfair for the doctrine of change of, in circumstances? For example, if both parties contract knowing that the government may at any time introduce new regulations to combat COVID-19, and such regulations may impede contractual performance, can the doctrine of change of circumstances still operate? Or should it be said that the parties have assumed the risk? So it's linked to the earlier question, I guess, that uh, Yongjun answered as well. Okay, I will um, try to answer these questions um, very briefly because um, this is only the earlier stage of what we will, what we think will be an um, uh, uh, explosion of uh, of, of litigation uh, on COVID-19 cases. So we don't see many the cases so far, but there is uh, already the first batch of typical cases on COVID-19 published by the Philippine People's Court. Uh, Interestingly, all these cases ended up um, settled by the parties or settled under, under mediation. So there is actually no ruling delivered by the court. All the parties, they uh, obviously, as I said before, the courts prefer to resolve all these disputes by mediation or contract or settlement. So that's that, that's. Uh, precisely evidence that the courts are making efforts to achieve that end. Um, in relation to manifest unfairness, this is not an entirely new concept to uh, Chinese law. Chinese courts do not introduce this concept uh, in, in these COVID-19 documents. Instead, this concept already existed in past law. So I guess what the Chinese courts will do is to um, uh, derive some past experience from cases uh, revolving around this, um, uh, this, this concept. Uh, so uh, what, what we 
we know is that unlike common law courts, Chinese judges and courts, they will inquire into the substantial fairness of the terms of the contract. They will see if the terms are achieving a proper balance between the interests of the two parties. Okay, if you have a contract which is uh, uh, evidently disadvantageous to one of the parties, then the courts, I would say, would most, most likely intervene and do something. Um, um, if uh, parties have assumed the risk, okay, so this probably, probably will re relate back to a um, question asked before, uh, what if the party is already allocated or assumed risk in the contract, then in Chinese law, I think it's uh, becoming clear that in that case, the courts will not intervene if the party has already assumed the risk. Um, in that case, it will, the risk will not be regarded as, uh, will be regarded as a commercial risk. And the doctrine of change of circumstances will not apply to a commercial risk. That is a risk already assumed by one of the parties or both parties. Uh, thanks, Tiao. I think this last question may be linked to just what you just said, but so we'll give it to Yongjun and Munen as well, I guess. Uh, can it not be argued that pandemics in themselves are not force majeure events, but it is their effects that are? So, for example, the regulatory orders around quarantine, immigration, closures, and performance. Uh, and it's the effects that are currently adequately addressed already in civil and common law practice. Uh, Yongjun, you want to try this first? Then Munin? Okay, well, great question. And I basically agree with um, th this argument. Um, unless there is a um, very concrete definition of first major, including um, like COVID-19 pandemic, then um, based on that first major close, it may be considered first major. But if not, then it would not be easy to generally say that um, COVID-19 pandemic may be incorporated into the uh, force majeure clause. So I think it is quite um, likely that you can argue that uh, pandemics in themselves are not force majeure events. I understand that there are different cases in different jurisdictions. For example, with regard to SARS, I know there's a French court decision where it stated that SARS is not a force majeure. Whereas in, in Germany, there was a um, lower court decision which stated that SARS is force majeure event. But it should be noted that German court was addressing the case where P2C contract was at issue. It was about travel contract between travel agency and customer. So when it comes to P2C contract, perhaps the force majeure, the scope of force majeure can be expanded a little bit wider. Um, and that's the case in Korea, because, you know, uh, as I have mentioned in my presentation, there is a Korea Fair Trade Commission, which is in charge of addressing the issue arising from P2C contract. So in, in reality, as you have mentioned in your question, it can adequately be addressed by um, administrative efforts like military orders or um, other measures. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Yongjun. Uh, Munin, would you want to add Thank to you. that? Thank you very much for the question. This is one of the uh, most uh, uh, frequently asked questions in, in, in Thailand. and. Uh, um, so, um, as I mentioned in my presentation that uh, force majeure uh, is not, um, you know, automatically, um, you know, relieve the obligation, uh, relieve the debtor from, from the obligation. Um, however, I would like to add now that under uh, the labor protection law in Thailand, uh, force majeure is very important um, to uh, determine the liability of the employer because there is one uh, provision uh, saying that if the business is temporarily closed, um, um, the employer and, and the employees do not have any work to do, uh, the employer must continue paying uh, the, the employees um, uh, seventy five percent of the of the of the wages of the normal rate of, of wage. Um, um, but if um, the um, temporary closure uh, is caused by a force majeure. Um, the employer doesn't need to pay at all. So um, the employers in Thailand tend to, you know, justify their uh, temporary postures uh, as a, a, a consequence of a force majeure. And what we advise um, the employers who came to us is that um, um, 
uh, it depends on you know um, a force majeure itself is not is not uh, sorry um, the pandemic itself is not you know a force majeure. Um, um, it, we we have to look at the um, the consequence you know of uh, the pandemic. For example, if um, the employer was ordered by the government to close the business, then um, that is force majeure. But if the employer closed the business uh, due to you know a financial effect of the pandemic, you know he uh, voluntarily closed you know the business even though he could continue you know with some difficulty. That is not a force majeure. So so I agree with this with this uh, comment that uh, the pandemic itself is not you know uh, a force majeure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Munin. I think it was the famous legal historian, Professor Baker, who, who sort of said that the common law was all about rights, in particular property rights, whereas the civil law was all about distributive justice. For a long time, I thought that that showed the strengths of the common law and the weakness of the civil law. But in the past year, starting with Mindy's brilliant conferences, and all the way to today, sort of made me realize that you know, we have to re-examine some of our premises and beliefs, right? And it might just be that the resilience required comes perhaps more from a civilian type system, right? Anyway, it remains to, for me now to thank the wonderful presentations uh, and presenters uh, that we've had today, to thank all of you participating in this webinar, and uh, thank you very much, and I hope that this will see you for the possible eighth um, CALS webinar in this series. Take care.